you're in one of our Bibles, that's Psalm 32. We'll be working our way through a little collection of Psalms 25 to 34 the last few months. And as we near the end, we reach Psalm 32 this morning. I'm going to pray and then read it to us. Psalm ends, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And we pray, therefore, Almighty God, that you would help us to understand more of the wonder of the forgiveness of sins, the depth of the problem, the beauty of the solution, and the gift of forgiveness in our time together this morning. Please. Don't just inform our minds, but work in our hearts and change us by what we hear, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 32, a maskil of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they will not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart." Hope you'll keep that in front of you. And there's also the outline on the back of the notice sheet, as I mentioned before. Um, I've been looking forward to this morning for a, a while. We've reached one of my favorite psalms. It's a song of celebration. You'll have discovered even as we read it about how to be truly happy in life. That's the, the meaning of the word blessed in verse one, truly happy. Not the sort of gone in an instant fleeting happiness that comes from a, a, a good meal or a moment of success but the kind of deep and profound and lasting contentment and joy that uh, can carry you through all of the highs and lows of life. And you know immediately that our world is full of people trying to tell us the path to true happiness. I've got a few books on my shelves just on this particular issue that summarize the teachings of different philosophers and thinkers down the age. What does uh, how does one find happiness? Everyone has their own theory. You'll find them as much on social media as in the works of ancient philosophy. Happy is found in knowing and being true to yourself. Happy is found in romantic and sexual love. Happiness is found in material accumulation and wealth, in getting away from it all on holiday. Happiness that someone is having a large and loving family who live a long way away. Uh, some of us may be able to relate to that quip. But I wonder what you would say instinctively. Where do you think true happiness, lasting happiness, is to be found in life? This would be our creator's authoritative answer. Truly happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh, and the psalm breaks in two. The first half, David talks about, his, uh, as a believer, about his own experience of being forgiven. And then in the second, he becomes a teacher 
and instructs us in the way that we should go. And those will be our points. First, the joy of forgiveness as it worked out in David's life. And as he tells his story in verses 1 to 5, he's unembarrassed, doesn't he, to talk about the extended and painful groaning that he experienced before he acknowledged his sin to God. So he says in verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand, God, was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And we should notice both the cause as well as the extent of David's grief. This happened to him when he was silent when rather than admitting his sin and guilt openly to God and asking for it to be forgiven, he chose instead to to bottle it up and to try and carry its burden alone. Uh, As I was preparing, I read some articles uh, about guilt. Here are a a few lines. Uh, As an emotion, guilt has a lot of power. It can cause physical and emotional turmoil. You might know guilt best as the nauseating twist in your stomach that accompanies the knowledge that you've hurt someone. Perhaps you also deal with recurring self-judgment because of what happened and your fear of others finding out. One more, feelings of guilt can lead to mood disorders like anxiety and depression, muscle tension, fatigue, insomnia, digestive issues, and crying. And David would say, I remember it all very, very well. Except the burden that he was carrying was even greater, even weightier than that, because he knew he hadn't just hurt other people. He knew that he'd offended the holy God, the one to whom one day we will all have to give an account for the things we've said, thought, and done. Uh, I remember standing outside my headmaster's office once. I I honestly can't remember what I'd done. If I could remember, I'm not sure I'd tell you. But on this occasion, I genuinely can't remember what it was. But I do remember the the sickening knot in my stomach and that feeling of being completely undone. There's nowhere to hide. Uh, No clever talk was going to get me out of it. Fear, shame you imagine having to stand in line outside God's study, knowing that you would soon have to face up to and pay the price for all of your wrongs? That's the kind of feeling that left David saying, my bones were wasting away. That's why he kept groaning all day long. His strength was all used up in the way a, a long, hot summer's day, if you can remember one of those, takes, uh, takes all of the strength out of you. There was nothing left of him. You can feel the, the physical as well as the mental misery that he carried with him at the time. God was convicting him of his sin, but David was steadfastly refusing to acknowledge it. Let me say, if you're you're here this morning as someone who um, doesn't believe in Jesus, you may not yet personally experience this level of guilt and groaning over your sin. Uh, If I can put it like this, that is only because you have no idea how serious it actually is. Uh, I saw a picture of someone standing in the street talking on a phone with an enormous grin on his face. And at first, the picture made you smile. It was one of those infectious smiles that this guy had. Clearly, everything was well in this man's world. But as you looked at the picture more closely, it was clever because you realized he was totally unaware of a man lurking in the shadows with a gun pointed at him. And it became clear that this man's sense of peace and happiness was an illusion. And our sin for all of us, unless we come to the Lord Jesus, is an objective problem with eternal consequences, whether or not we share David's experience of misery. And so our greatest need is for a solution. And that is why being forgiven brings so much joy. David's moment of clarity comes in verse 4. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you, God, and I didn't cover my iniquity. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Uh, the author and journalist Kingsley Amos wasn't a fan of uh, God. I was reading back an article of his the other day. It reminded me that I, he once said, I'm an atheist, yes, but it's more just that I hate God. That was his view in, on life. But then shortly before his death, he said, one of Christianity's great advantages is that it offers an explanation. I think he meant a solution for sin. I haven't got one. He said, I think to the, journalist, to the journalist who must have been a Christian, you can be forgiven your sins, which must be a wonderful thing because I carry my sins around with me and there is nobody to forgive them. But here we feel David's relief. He's got to the end of himself and so finally he turns to God and as he does, he finds in God what everyone who truly turns to him finds, which is not an ogre or an executioner, but a patient father who is full of grace. Now, to confess your sin to the Lord is to do three things. It's to acknowledge that it's real. It's to admit that you deserve nothing but God's wrath. And then it's to ask him for mercy. Acknowledge, admit, and ask. And David did that, and so the Lord forgave him. And just look at the joy it brought him. It's verse 1 again. Truly happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Truly happy is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The, the deceit there is the same as the silence was in verse 3. It's the, the self-deception of refusing to admit my need to God. And Blessed, truly happy, is the one who gives up that charade. You might have noticed there are three words for sin in verse 1, transgression, iniquity, sin. We won't go into the detail, they're just different angles on the same problem. Wonderfully, though, there are then three words for forgiveness as well, because in verse 1, sin is both forgiven and covered, and in verse 2, it's not counted against us. And that spread of words emphasizes totality. Every kind of sin is dealt with in all of its entirety. Uh, a man was talking to a friend of mine about his life, and the illustration that this man used was of a swimming pool. And he said it was as if on the surface his life was completely still, uh, a successful career, uh, an apparently happy family. But then he said lying on the bottom of the pool, and apparently visible only to him, were all of the mistakes that he'd made in life, the people he'd mistreated and walked over, the lies he'd told to make himself good and work his way up the ladder. And as he thought about his life, he could see all of his sin just lying there on the bottom of the pool. And he was aware of it continually, and he was terrified that someone else might discover it. You think, wouldn't it be amazing if someone could come along and then just put a cover over the pool that could never be removed. Or fill it with concrete and bury it forever. And David says, the Lord has covered over my sin. It's a version of the word from verse 5. Uh, David had tried in vain to cover up his own sin, but when he confessed it openly, then the Lord covered it for him. And the forgiven word in verse 1 is interesting as well. It means literally lifted or, or carried. And in Genesis, we're told Cain had to carry his own guilt for murdering his brother Abel. But then in Isaiah 53, God promises a suffering servant, Jesus, who will carry, bear the sins of many. It's all the same word. And David says, the one who's truly happy in life is the one whose sins have been carried away by Jesus, born on the cross, so that we need never bear them again. When David was bearing the weight of his own sin, it was a, a back-breaking burden. 
along came the Lord and offered to carry it for him. Just to set this in some context, you may know that the, the book of Psalms starts with two other great pronouncements of blessing. Um, it's the same word as we've got here. Truly happy, says Psalm 1, is the one who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. Truly happy, says Psalm 2, is the one who takes refuge in the sun. And this is detail being colored in for us. This is the word upon which we're to meditate day and night. This is what happens when you take refuge in the sun. We're truly happy. We because we meditate, we turn over in our minds day and night this glorious truth that the Son has borne the curse of our sin in our place so that we might be given the joy, the freedom of total forgiveness as we take refuge in the Son. Makes me wonder, are you still hiding? Have you confessed your sin openly to God in that way if you asked him for mercy and if you have do you realize how truly blessed and happy you are leads us into our second main heading this morning before we come to the Lord's table what a great morning it is for us to be sharing the bread and wine together the joy of forgiveness as it works out for us and as I said in the second half of the psalm the king then becomes a prophet um, you'll see in verse 8, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Uh, you may have tried at some stage to pass on a significant instruction to a child, not just sort of the, the run-of-the-mill instructions that you might give to children all of the time, but the kind that they really can't forget. And as much as you were trying to communicate, you, you were very aware that their head was somewhere totally different and that it wasn't going in. And so in desperation, you... You put your hands on their shoulders, maybe you said, look me in the eye, Let register this, and then you told them whatever the important instruction was. It's that sense with David here. He wants us really to take on board what he's saying. And so he says, now I'm going to counsel you with my eye upon you. I'm looking to make sure this is going in. Listen up. Three lessons. First, don't be a mule. Verse 9, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, I know that some of you are, are very horsey, and uh, you won't like any kind of association of horses with bad things. You'll want to tell me that horses have great qualities, that they can be brave and playful and dependable and loyal. But even you uh, will admit that they can be very stubborn and that if you don't train them properly, they have a mind of their own and go off and do whatever they want to. We have the, the phrase as stubborn as a mule. Uh, my dictionary defines it as determined to do what you want and unwilling to change your mind, often in a way that annoys other people. Uh, apparently, you might know someone like that. Try not to elbow the person sitting next to you. But David says, when, we, when it comes to the most important decision that you are ever going to make in your life, do not be a mule. Don't just keep going willfully your own way, but pay attention to this lesson. Verse 6, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to the Lord at a time when the Lord may be found. Uh, prayer is just the confession of sin we've been thinking about, and David is saying to us, pleading with us, urging us, come home to God now, because there is a door of opportunity for you to be forgiven that is open, but it won't stay open forever. It may be that your email inbox is a bit like mine. I've signed up to so many things over the years. I, my inbox now every morning is full of messages from companies offering me uh, a limited time offer. I know I can unsubscribe. You can tell me afterwards all about that. But you, these messages come through so... But there might be some really good deal that comes at some point in the future. So I haven't yet brought myself to do it. But you will know that when you get that many messages coming in, you just get desensitized to them. When everything is urgent, nothing is urgent. 
But here is an offer that really is. Miss this. You don't just miss out on three shirts for £99 or a limited time 50% off coupon or whatever it is. You miss out on having your sins covered by God, born away by Jesus on the cross. Um, God speaks in Proverbs of a time when the calamity of judgment will unfold. And he says of the stubborn, the obstinate, the mules, then they will call upon me, but I will not listen. Then they will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Prophet Isaiah puts the same lesson positively. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Because that's how you come to know the freedom, the true happiness of having all of your sins completely forgiven. You see how it's expressed in the second half of verse 6. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him as anyone who confesses their sins to the Lord. Because verse 7, you Lord are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The, the great waters are a reference back to the flood in Genesis. They stand for God's judgment. But if you've confessed your sin to God, if you've received his mercy, then as the flood of his judgment rises on the last day, the waters will never reach you. The, the Lord himself is a hiding place. He is your keeper. He's your protector. So don't be a mule. Second, be glad in the Lord. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Be glad sounds a, a little bit weak um, for something so momentous, doesn't it? But rejoice shout for joy there may be more on point and we're given two more reasons to rejoice here consequences of the forgiveness that christ won for us um, there's a bit of detail for us to think about here but bear with it because i think you'll find it, it worthwhile the the first consequence is in the name that david gives to his people do you see he uh, to god's people in verse 11 he calls us the righteous it's a clever combination of um, Bible ideas that goes on here. Back in verse 2, when uh, David said that when we pray, the Lord no longer counts our sins against us. That count word has some big Bible history. It's often translated credit. Um, it was first used back in Genesis when Abraham believed God's word, and it was counted. It was credited to him as righteousness. And that link between not counting, not crediting sins to us, but counting righteousness to us is in David's mind here in Psalm 32. The Apostle Paul makes that explicit in Romans 4. But this is what happens when you confessed your sin. God stopped counting your sin against you, and he started crediting the righteousness of Jesus to your account instead. Uh, I know of a charity that once received a surprise donation of one million pounds. And as you can imagine, they weren't a big charity. The treasurer nearly had a heart attack. They opened the bank account one morning, and there it was. Cue lots of panic <laughs> about what to do with it and excitement. This, though, is amazing, isn't it? That if you've confessed your sins, if you've trusted in Jesus and his death on the cross for you, you open up your spiritual bank account. And that debt of your sin that's, that you could never pay, it's gone forever. And in its place, God has credited, he's deposited in your account all of the righteous perfection of Jesus himself. So that now in, in him, it, it's truly yours, and you are righteous. And that's why you rejoice. The second consequence of confessing your sin, the second reason to be glad in the Lord this morning is in verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, 
but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. That's obviously not saying that the Christian will never experience sorrow in this life. But we know the man of sorrows. It's the same word that's used here. And so we know that one day all of our sorrow will be gone. And while we wait, you see in verse 10, we're surrounded by the Lord's steadfast love. I just want to encourage you to think of the places that you'll be going this week. Uh, the, the tasks and appointments that await you at work and in life. And no doubt some excite you and some make you nervous. You, you won't be able to see this, but wherever you are this week, and whatever you're doing, whatever situation you find yourself in, however hopeless, God promises that you will be surrounded on every side by the, the everlasting, faithful, and unbreakable love of God himself. Is that not a wonderful thought? If you've confessed your sins, God will never, ever be against you, ever, but will only and always be for you, and that that love will surround you forever. So even when you muck up and fall, you won't fall outside of God's love, you'll fall within it. So be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heaven. I hope you'll do that when we sing and come to the Lord's table in a moment. But just this final lesson before we do. And in verse 8, David speaks not only as God's king, but also as a model believer. And when you know the wonder and joy of sins forgiven, it's just not something you can keep to yourself, is it? You want everyone else to, to know it. So David says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. At which point many Christians think we must be having a laugh. And they say, I, I could never talk to anyone about my faith. And I want us to be reassured that God doesn't expect us all to be preachers. We've all got different gifts and personalities and temperaments and opportunities. But it might surprise you if I say, I suspect that you shouldn't underestimate yourself. My hunch is that you are already a great evangelist that that is something you are wonderful at already. Think about what you do when you receive a piece of good news, uh, an engagement in the family, a test result, or, or just about what you do when you find a new coffee shop that your friends haven't discovered yet that sells amazing pastries, or you come across a special offer in your inbox one morning. Uh, I bet you think, do you know what? I must tell Dave about this. I must tell Sarah. And you do because you, you love passing on good news, you are a great evangelist. Well, now we are talking about the very best news in the world. So I'd love you to think explicitly, specifically of a friend of yours who doesn't know Christ. And uh, maybe there's a newspaper they read every day. Maybe there's a website they go to for their news, a radio station they listen to. Maybe you know that they love listening to playlists on Spotify or watching films or TV shows, whatever it is they do with their downtime. You, you can pretty much guarantee, can't you, that they are not going to hear the news that they really need to hear from their newspaper or radio. They're not going to find it on the BBC website or on Netflix or TikTok. Then you want to Say to them, seek the Lord while he may be found. Turn to him while he is near. Because you, you want your friends to be truly happy, don't you? Of course we do. Not the gone in an instant fleeting happiness that comes from a good meal or a moment of success or getting a bargain online. But a profound and lasting contentment and joy that can carry them through the sorrows of life. And true happiness is not found in knowing and being true to yourself or in romantic and sexual love or in material accumulation and wealth, in academic success and reputation, in another holiday or a 
nice house or a shopping spree. Truly happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Truly happy is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And you know that blessing already if you've turned to Christ. And now we get to be the means by which the people in our life can come to know it too. So three lessons. Don't be a mule. Be glad in the Lord. And tell the world about our wonderful Savior. Let's pray together. We all like sheep have gone astray, turned each one to their own way, but the Lord has laid on him, the Lord Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And our Father, we do simply want to stop and say thank you for this greatest of all blessings, that as we trust in your Son, the Lord Jesus, you forgive our sin, you cover it over, and you promise never to count it against us again, but to remove it from us as far as the east is from the west, to bury it in the bottom of the sea, to put it behind your back, and to remember our sin no more. Thank you that you clothe us in the righteousness of Christ. Thank you that we are surrounded by your steadfast and eternal love. Thank you that you will never be against us, but only for us. And thank you that we know we will be with you forevermore in a perfect new world if we have trusted in you. We pray, Father, therefore, that you would get rid of any traces of being a mule in our hearts, any stubbornness that refuses to listen to you. We pray that you would help us to be as glad as we should be, to rejoice and shout for joy as much as we should at this wonderful news. And we pray that you would help us to overcome our fears and you would empower us to tell the people of this town this wonderful, wonderful news. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.